Well, good morning, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, if you're tuning in for the first time, we want to say welcome to you to the First Free Maple Woods live stream Sunday service. We want to give you, our church family, a big virtual hug. I miss you all. I know we can't be together right now, but I look forward to the days uh, when we can. Also, I want to say thank you to our saints of First Free. Um, man, thank you for holding down your faith and for continuing to trust in the Lord, um, for your patience also in these trying times. Your faith has been an encouragement. And I also want to say to those, those of you who may be frustrated or angry um, because of the, the crisis and, and, and the uh, circumstances that we're living in, for those of you who are anxious, I want to encourage you. I want you to find peace. I want to encourage you to find peace that surpasses understanding in our living God. And also as a warning to those of you who are using this crisis as an opportunity for the flesh to commit evil. Just know that there is a God and you can either repent and meet him as savior or you can die in your sins and see him as judge. Until then, we, God's people, we will speak truth. We will stand for justice and we will walk in the love of the Lord. Now, I want to also issue my own personal happy birthday to Pastor Todd. Um, just, just me, myself, I want to say thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to grow. Uh, thank you for your mentorship. Uh, thank you for encouraging me, for listening to me, uh, for understanding. I look forward to many years of uh, good uh, godly service alongside of you. Also, today is a very special day. It is Mother's Day, a day where we celebrate women who have given sacrificially so that another may live and have their needs met. So happy Mother's Day to mothers, birth and adoptive. Happy Mother's Day to aunts and grandmothers to older sisters, or younger, <laughs> um, to um, friends, also to church mothers, to anyone, any lady who has given. And I also want to issue, uh, personally, a happy Mother's Day to my mom, Eula, to my aunt, Tanya, uh, to my stepmom, Tammy, and to my mother-in-law, Suzanne. And I just want to say thank you for who you are in my life. And finally, I want to say a happy Mother's Day to my wife, Dottie. You've given me the gift of family. There's no other woman I would want to raise my children with. I love you, sweetie. Thank you. <clears throat> now, we are going through a series called Just Like Us. And as Pastor Todd has said in the past, Just Like Us refers to people through whom God has done extraordinary things, but they're just like us. They're men and women of the same weaknesses, men and women of the same temptations, uh, men and women who go through the same things we go through. And today I want to talk about a very special lady named Abigail. Um, out of 1 Samuel chapter 25, her first encounter with David, who was not yet king. Now, I want to preface this with, uh, with an illustration. I, am, uh, I have kind of this love-hate relationship with sitcoms. Some I like, some are pretty good, but some I kind of have this, I, I just have this way that it rubs me the wrong way, I think you want to call it, because the character who is normally the dad or husband is kind of like this goofball who can't get anything right. And, you know, I'm raising my sons to not be goofballs. So I don't want them watching TV and seeing a goofball. And the mom uh, and the wife character is always the voice of reason, the voice of wisdom, having to fix the problems that the goofball dad and husband 
has uh, created. But I must admit that some of the show's creators must have read their Bible because when you read the case of Abigail and Nabal, art is imitating life. So if you will, look at with me to 1 Samuel chapter 25. And what I want you to focus on as we think about Abigail today um, is who she is as a wise woman and the importance of cherishing that wisdom. Because when you cherish that wisdom, it may very well save your life. Now, in order to appreciate Abigail and how much her wisdom and integrity stand out, it's helpful to understand kind of the place and the setting that she was living in. At this point in time, Israel is in kind of a political turmoil. Um, right now, the eyes of the nation are on two men, David, whom God has decreed and chosen as the next king of Israel, and Samuel, the last judge, anointed him king. And then you have Saul, who is the current king, but is refusing to abdicate the throne, the throne that he obviously realizes he's already lost. Now, Saul and his allies are creating this narrative where David is seen as the usurper. He's taking something that doesn't belong to him. And so Saul runs him out of the house. David was actually serving him and uh, being a part of his family. And because of Saul's jealousy, he ran David out of his house and started to chase him. I think his plan was, if you can see the way things are going down, his plan is, if he could kill David, he would ruin God's plan. Now, I want you to think about that for a second, how foolish that is to think that one could ruin or thwart or stop God's will. But here's Saul in his foolishness thinking that if only he could catch David and kill him, he could remain king. And doing this kind of transnational hide and seek or cat and mouse, or if you're familiar with the movie Catch Me If You Can, game that is going on, David has a group of warriors that's traveling with him. Now, as you're traveling with a bunch of people, sometimes you get tired. Sometimes you get hungry. And when these things happen, you, 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 you start the morale starts to uh, crumble a little bit. And so David is worried about the welfare and the morale of his warriors. They've been traveling day and night from this place to the next, living in caves, sleeping under the moon. And so David wants to feed his warriors. And I can imagine as he's thinking about where they are in uh, southern Judah. Let's take a look here as we think about the setting. They're in southern Judah. And they know, he knows that they're near this place called Maon. And Maon is a city where a man named Nabal lives. And David goes back and thinks, oh, wait a minute. We, we, we did something for Nabal in the past. I think we, um, didn't we protect his sheep? Didn't we watch out for his shepherds, keep them safe? And I know it's the shearing season, and there's usually festivities going on, a lot of food passed around. Maybe Nabal can give us some food. So David sends some messengers over to Nabal to ask his messenger, to ask Nabal if they could spare some food for David and his men. Now, right here in Maon, the interesting thing about the name of that city, Maon, is it means dwelling place. But this particular Maon has developed a reputation of being a dwelling place of evil. So David's messengers go to Nabal and they send word. David says, you know, we protected him. He's also in the tribe of Judah. Surely being part of the family, Nabal would help me out. And if you guys are familiar with kind of the... Um, um, hospitality uh, etiquette in the Middle East, um, they, they, they treat hospitality very highly. Um, visitors who come by, they take care of them. And so 
I think based on these assumptions, uh, David thought that Nabal would be willing to help him. But the response that Nabal gives David, he pretty much trashes him. He totally denounces any familial connection. Um, even even goes so far as to question David's identity. He he calls David a slave who is rebelling against his master. And he keeps all of the fest, festival food, all of the feast of the, the food of the feast to himself. As a matter of fact, if you look in verse eleven, um, I'm not going to read it, but if you look at verse eleven. Nabal actually uses the first person pronoun seven, pronoun seven times to describe him not sharing with uh, David. So you can see that Nabal is self-centered. Now, when David receives word from his messengers of Nabal's response, you got to understand where he's in. Saul's been chasing him. He's been running for his life. He's sick and tired. He's sick and tired of being bullied. And when he gets this response from Nabal, them's fighting words, Jack. And David straps on his sword, literally, and his mission is to wipe out the entire clan. Now, in this testosterone-fueled clash, in the middle of this is a woman named Abigail. Abigail lives in a society that doesn't value women very much. On one hand, if she were to marry, which she did, marry a wealthy man, she shouldn't or wouldn't be surprised to be part of a polygamous relationship. She probably wouldn't be the only wife. She would share her husband with other women. On the other hand, if she married poor, Her best hope would be to have a lot of children, preferably boys, put them to work. And then she would work her fingers to the bone on a daily basis just to survive. Just like her husband Nabal, even the environment itself was harsh for women. However, what's interesting when you read verse 3 is Abigail is described as being discerning and wise and beautiful. So she is not only in stark contrast to Nabal, but the entire city of Meon itself. It's almost as as if she's a shining light in a dark place. And she receives the report from one of the servants. So here you have Nabal's response to David, David is going to take Nabal out. And one of the servants is like, oh, we got to go tell the lady of the house. She always takes care of problems. You know, I, I think Abigail, it says Nabal was a very wealthy man. My speculation is he still has his money because of her. I don't think it has anything to do with him. But the servant goes and runs and tells Abigail because he wants Abigail to solve the problem. She's a wise woman. And he, I love the way he describes it. You know he's a worthless fool. He's about to get everybody killed. Can you do something? And I think what's important to understand is what she doesn't do that would help us see what kind of woman Abigail really is. One thing that she doesn't do is she doesn't behave like a helpless woman. She, she's not sitting there twiddling her fingers and hopelessly waiting to be rescued from the situation. Abigail also isn't manipulating and deceiving David in order to incite violence and get Nabal killed. I mean, I can imagine being in a bad marriage and she's like, oh, here's my ticket out of here. She doesn't do that. She doesn't work it out in her favor. She also doesn't behave in an overbearing and domineering way, demanding to get her own way. And though she's described as beautiful, Abigail doesn't use her beauty to seduce David. David's a young man. He's seducible. But she doesn't do that. 
Let's look at the text to see what she does, starting in verse 14. 1 Samuel 25, verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. It wasn't even just he gave them a negative response. He actually went off on them. Oh, that's not good. Not good at all, Nabal. Yet the men, this is the servant now, the guy, one of the guys, one of the shepherds. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the field. See, during that grazing season when they're feeding the sheep and things like that, he's saying as long as we were with them, we were safe. Verse 16, and they were a wall to us, both night by night and by day. All the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know this and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against all his house. See, Nabal's sin, Nabal's foolishness didn't just stick on him. It affected everyone that was in his sphere of influence. And against all his house. And he's such a worthless man that one cannot even speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and 200 skins of wine and five sheep already prepared. And five sayers of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. Why? Because he probably would have stopped her. And as she rode on the donkey, she came down under the cover of the mountain. Behold, David and his men came down toward her. So he was making a direct route to to Nabal's house. And she met them. Now David said in verse 21, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness. See, David is justified in his anger. The servant has just confirmed that David and his men did indeed do what they said they did. Surely in vain have I guarded all this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned me, what? Evil for good. When you return someone evil for good, not only is it foolish, it is devilish. I heard it said one time, If you return good for good, it's human. If you return evil for good, it's devilish. If you return good for evil, that's divine. Verse 22. God do so to the enemies of David and more also. If by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. Verse 23. Here's Abigail. This wise and beautiful woman. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey. Look at what she did. And fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Here's this wise and regal and beautiful woman. And what does she do in place of the servants and in place of Nabal? She falls to her face in front of David. So let's add to the list also. She is humble. She does not think herself too good to give her life for another. And not only that, here she is before what has been celebrated as the nation's greatest warrior. David has not lost a battle. David has fought wars. David has delivered Israel in place of Saul more than once. So he's a fighter. So her courage to meet him at the road. So not only is she wise and beautiful and humble, she is courageous. To stand before an angry young man full of spontaneous actions at this point 
because he's been disrespected. Now, if you guys and ladies don't understand what it feels like to be disrespected as a young man, when I was growing up, one of the most important things for us is to have respect. And when you disrespected someone, we call it dissing. When you diss someone, man, hey, it's time to go to blows, Jack. I mean, the, the, the very fact of disrespect from another human being was something that was not tolerated when I was growing up. And so here's David now being disrespected by this fool who he's helped in the past. Oh, no, no, no. And here's this woman now jumping right. Imagine these two men about to get into this class and she jumps right in the middle of it. Wow. Now, Abigail is this woman who was full of wisdom, who was full of courage, who was full of, uh, of beauty and humility. And we see now that as, as the three people, Nabal, Abigail, and David are about to converge, we see how they all respond in the face of wisdom. And I want you to see how each one responds in the face of wisdom. This determines their outcome. And this is what I want you to understand. In anything you can get in life, of all the things you can get in life, material goods, uh, uh, fame, fortune, whatever, one of the most important things you can get in life is wisdom. Now, let's look at Nabal's re- Na- sorry, I used to call him Nabal's response to wisdom. Though he was a very wealthy man, he was also a wicked and worthless man. And the only good decision was marrying Abigail. And like I said before, my speculation is he did not even make that decision for himself. I think it was a prearranged par- uh, uh, marriage with, uh, through his parents. I don't see him being able to spot a good woman and doing the right thing to get her to love him. I just don't see it. He is self-centered, he is short-sighted, and has no care for those around him. This man has spent years with wisdom and has learned nothing from it. He has rejected wisdom by the way he ignored his wife to the point that she had to save his life without his knowledge. What does the Bible say about people like this? Well, if you can't turn to it right now, I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and then I'm going to read verses 29 through 31. This is what the Bible says about foolish people when they come in contact with wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Because they hated knowledge and do not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have the feel of their own devices. So because Nabal is a fool, what happened to him? Well, if you remember, he was having a big old party, one that was fit for a king. And see, that's the interesting thing about Nabal He was a fool who thought he was a king. And isn't that what foolish people do? They think too highly of themselves. And it cost him his life. Abigail let him sober up, didn't tell him that night. She let him sober up and enjoy his last night on earth. And she told him the next day, boy, you lucky. David was about 600 meters from taking you out. And I went and I appeased him. I fed his men and I apologized on your behalf, and that's why you're here today. And I don't know if it was the announcement of the coming of his death or the fact that she took some of his stuff and gave it to David, but whatever it was, one of those things called him to have a stroke, a heart attack, or something, and it says he fell like a stone, but it says 10 days later, he didn't die of natural causes, He died, he says, at verse 38, it says, about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal. 
and he died. The Lord eventually judged Nabal's foolishness. And if we choose to live foolish lives, there will be a reckoning. There will be a day when the Lord will judge us for our works. And it may not even be in this lifetime, but there will be a day if we reject wisdom. Now, how did David respond to wisdom? See, whereas Nabal was a fool who thought he was a king, David was a king who was about to do something foolish. But Abigail stopped him. So you got to understand the area that David was in was in his hometown or near his hometown. This is all, the region is all southern, is Judah. It's, it's all allotted to the tribe of Judah. So this area is the area that David grew up near. People heard of him. People knew him. And if he's done something like this, though Nabal is an evil man, because of his wealth, because of his fame, he was also very influential. And if David would have done something as foolish as killing him by his own hands, who knows how that would affect his kingdom, growing his kingdom, expanding his kingdom. As a matter of fact, Hebron, which is just north of Maon, was David's first capital. But instead of killing Nabal and having these consequences on his kingship, he listened to Abigail. It says in verse um, 30, uh, 32, And David said to Abigail, 1 Samuel 25, 32, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And listen to this. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. How many of us try to work our salvation with our own hands and end up worse than before we tried to fix things? You know, sometimes in my life, and, I, and this is also experience speaking, that a lot of times I've only gone to the Lord as a last result after I ruined everything and made it even worse beforehand, and all I have left is to turn to God. And I'm like, Lord, I made it worse. Can you fix it, please? I don't know what to do anymore. And by his grace, he's done it. But he's not obligated to. And David notices this, is that if I'd have done this in my testosterone-fueled rage, this would have affected me, and you saved me from that. Verse 34, for as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had heard and come to meet me truly by morning, there had not been left to Nabal such as one male. And so David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, go up in peace to your house. Listen to this next part. See, I have obeyed your voice. And I have granted your petition. David listened to wisdom. He got it. He got it. And as we'll learn later, not only did he listen to wisdom in this instant, he cherished wisdom. Because when he found out Nabal died, what did he do? He said, I'm marrying that woman. <laughs> That's a good woman. That is a virtuous woman. That is a Proverbs 31 woman. Now it's my woman. <laughs> And Abigail, what about Abigail? You know, her name means father's joy. And you don't have to turn there, but in Proverbs 29, 3, it says, the son who cherishes wisdom brings joy to his father. And David now has just married the, the father's joy, who is also wise. So you know his life is going to be blessed. Abigail represents the ideal of what God wanted for David. You know, if you remember before, he was married to Saul's daughter, and that caused him all kinds of issues. And he lost her to another man. Saul took her away from him and married off to another man. And God gave him a virtuous woman in place of her. She is truly a Proverbs 31 woman. And, and, and instantly is one of the few faithful representation of godliness in the Old Testament, especially during this time. 
She is a light in one of the darkest times for David and one of the dark times for the nation of Israel. Now, and I just went through all that. (laughs) What about us? What does that mean for us? What about God? What does that mean for God? Now, the good news is, in order to get wisdom, you don't have to marry it. You don't have to marry into wisdom. As a matter of fact, you should start young in pursuing wisdom because wisdom is something that is built up through maturing into consistent good and right decisions in our everyday lives. Now, the question then would be, what is a good and right decision? Well, it's not choosing the path of least resistance. If any of you know, if you're going to follow Christ, it's not the easiest path. And I think some people who have professed Christ and, and, and kind of dabbled into this Christian life have had the mistaken notion that if I do this, then God being all powerful will make my life easier. And if you think that's what wisdom is about, you're going to be sorely disappointed because that is not what wisdom is. Wisdom is also not necessarily looking for the best outcome for yourself. If you remember, Abigail was willing to take the penalty for Nabal and all the servants. That means she was willing to be killed by David herself. That's probably not her best outcome. What wisdom is, is making the decision that will bring the most honor and glory to God. One of the things that we're continually teaching our children in our home is, what is the purpose of life? The purpose of life is not to look for the most fun thing. The purpose of life is not to do stuff so that you have a good outcome. Some people will say, Have all the fun you can because you're going to die one day. Just do whatever you want. Other people will say, deny all worldly desires, rise above them, achieve enlightenment. I don't think God put us on this earth not to enjoy it. So I don't think that's it either. I think for the Christian, however, our purpose is to represent God accurately in this world. When people look at a Christian, they should say, you're a little Jesus. And if people can say that about you and believe it, you're probably living a wise life. And the way that we do this is by the help of the Holy Spirit of God. We read his word. We ask for his help. We see what Jesus has done in his interaction, in his interpersonal relationships with people. And we say, okay, I'm going to do that to the best of my ability with your help, God. And as we begin to practice these things, we develop a life of wisdom. Now, Abigail wasn't perfect. And neither of us are perfect. But the reason why she's called wise is because she did not place herself first. When we think about wisdom, it's not something that comes from within ourselves that we can attain on our own, but we can get it very easily. How do we get wisdom? God says, just ask me. He who lacks wisdom, ask. Let him ask God, James 1.5, who gives generously He gives generously. He's not, may I have a drop of water, please? He's ready to pour it out on us. Who gives generally to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But see, the key is, let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything of the Lord. Why? Because he's a man who is unstable in all his ways. See, when an unstable person asks for something precious, you think they're going to get it? No. 
I love my children. But I can't imagine handing my car keys to my six-year-old son because he is unstable in his ways. He's young, he's rash, and he makes decisions like this. And putting him to behind the wheel of a big, huge vehicle like that and saying, now be wise with that, is foolish on my part. So God will not give to an unstable person something precious like wisdom because what will they do with wisdom? They will only think of themselves and their own gain and use wisdom to manipulate, to deceive, to seduce. So we must be willing to let go of all of that to receive the wisdom that God has. Why? Because the wisdom that is from above is different from worldly wisdom. The wisdom that God wants to give us is not the kind of wisdom where we can cheat on our taxes and get a little bit extra money. It's not the kind of wisdom where we can rub shoulders with the right people, say the right things, get a little bit more influence, a little bit more clout, get that special uh, invitation to that party that we couldn't get to otherwise. True wisdom from above is first pure. James chapter 3 verse 17. It is pure this wisdom has no ulterior motive. This wisdom has no, no uh, attention to itself more than others, but places others before itself. The wisdom from above is peaceable. What did Abigail achieve by interceding between David and uh, uh, Nabal? She achieved peace. Though it only lasted 10 days, she did save his life. This wisdom from above is also gentle. Are we gentle people, Christians? Are we people that someone has no fear coming up to and wanting to have this interpersonal interaction with us? Are we so rash and harsh that people are afraid to come to us and talk to us? Wisdom is gentle. It is open to reason. Wisdom is teachable. No one has the market on wisdom. There is more that we all can learn. It is full of mercy and good fruits. So wisdom actually acts out its philosophy. The fruit of the Spirit. I'm not going to try to name all nine now because I may embarrass myself. My kids know it more than I do. But you know the fruit of the Spirit. And you know what God requires of us in our lives. Are you actually doing that? Don't just be hearers of the word only, but doers also. Wisdom is impartial. Wisdom does not treat one person better than another. Wisdom does not discriminate. And right now, our country is on the verge of collapse because of partiality. On the verge of collapse because of discrimination. On the verge of collapse because of fear and pride driving the behaviors of this nation's people. That is not wisdom. That is wickedness and foolishness. And wisdom is sincere. Sincere. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 24, Jesus is called the power and the wisdom of God. He does not expect perfection from us. Perfection has been imputed to us through his son. But he does expect faithfulness. He does expect devotion. Because what, we, what he's given us through our identity in Jesus Christ, he's not only given us wisdom, but he's given us life. He's given us completeness. He's given us relationship, and he's given us his love. And we would do well to remember that, to remember what God has given us, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. Because whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, we know that God is there, and he will help us. And to help us remember our church family has made a video 
from a song by Ellie Holcomb called Don't Forget to Remember. So I want, I want you to watch this with me and see this video. you go and whatever you do the earth will keep giving you clue after clue so you won't forget to remember what's true like every day when the sun rises high the warmth that you feel is God's love by your side oh and just like the birds who keep humming they And as we close, we see that wisdom is actually remembering, remembering God, remembering what he's done, remembering our Savior, remembering that no matter where we find ourselves, he will always be with us. And so now on that, let's close out. Let the love of God move you. Let the wisdom of God guide you. And let the peace of God Keep you.